What's up, YouTubers? All right, we did it. We made it. We are on the last chapter, chapter eight. Um, we have made it through the series so far, and we are almost there to the new song. And uh, I'm a day behind everybody else. Uh, so, without further jabber, I am going to um, just get into this. I was sat in a cafe across from a strange French man in a suit. I had to decide over a five minute drink if this was the man that I was going to live with for the next year of my life. A week before, I'd been sat in the same cafe with a Polish man. My friend Luke had put me in touch. Me and my girlfriend had decided to move into separate houses in hopes it would fix our crumbling relationship. The guy seemed pretty chill online and so I'd already agreed to move in with him. This was just a little informal meet before we did. A few minutes in, I instantly regretted everything. He told me a story of how the week before he'd come home drunk and he'd pissed all over his own living room and was in hysterics about it. I laughed nervously, taking a sip of water as I imagined the future of watching Netflix shows near a carpet that stank of piss. He then went on to tell me a story of how this girl that he'd liked had rejected his advances, so he'd, in his own words, grabbed her by the pussy and she slapped him. He wasn't sure if it was going to work out between them. I was certain it wasn't going to work out between them. I didn't laugh this time. I made an excuse and I left. When I got home, I messaged him, making up a lie that me and my girlfriend had patched things up and she'd be moving with me instead. I had a week to find a new roommate. I was, for all intents and purposes, a loud little bugger. I'd often spend unhealthy amounts of time making beats so the person that I moved in with needed to be able to tolerate noise. I found this Facebook group called Brighton Bands of Musicians and I posted on it. It went something like this. Hi, I'm a noisy person and I'm looking for another noisy person to live with. Enter the French man. He'd moved from France in hopes of kick-starting his music career. He was working in a restaurant and busking on the streets whenever he had time. He was, for the better part of the word, eccentric, and at first I couldn't quite place him. The bar was set extremely low by the carpet pissing sex offender though, so the French man could have probably told me he was part of an extreme terrorist organisation and I'd probably said, great mate, when can you move in? The house was only meant for two, but in true cheapskate style we found a third housemate called Tom, who was probably one of the f funniest people I've ever met. Tom would go on hour-long rants about how Nicolas Cage is the world's best actor. I said, put the bunny back in the box. And he makes a compelling case too. That French man was Romain Axiza. We'd go on to form a band called The Big Push and he'd become one of my closest friends. The second week we moved in together, it was his birthday. So me and Tom decided to gaffer tape about 50 baguettes and bunches of garlics to the walls and the ceilings to decorate. It was 2016 and political correctness hadn't come into full effect. He still didn't think it was very funny. My energy was only improving during this time, although progress was slow. The doctor had recommended I do a second transplant to speed things up. I returned to LA for the second time with my close friend Saran and went through the motions again. Eventually, I'd switched to their sister clinic in Frankfurt, where I entered one of the more unusual periods of my, of my life. The UK has border regulations on certain medications and supplements. Some I shouldn't have been taken back with me. I remember fashioning a hidden compartment in my suitcase where I would smuggle IV bags full of various nutrients and immune modulating drugs over the border. I did this a few times. One drug, Filgastrim, was often given to AIDS or cancer patients with low neutrophil counts. On, on my tests, my neutrophils were always outside of range on the lower side, so the injections would theoretically raise them. The issue was I was still broke. I don't think the doctor realized how broke. I was meant to pay for private nurse to administer the drips, but I couldn't afford it. So without telling the doctor, I taught myself how to administer an IV watching YouTube tutorial videos. First, it was very messy. I messed up a lot of veins trying to get the cath catheter to stay in. There was a lot of blood, but eventually I got the hang of it. I'd be sitting in the living room watching One Punch Man while an IV bag dripped slowly into my veins. And day by day I got stronger and stronger. The issue was I started noticing my food intolerances getting worse. The stem cells had improved my pain, energy, clarity of thought, but it worsened my ability to tolerate food, something I later learned was caused by MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome. Some other stories also started circulating online groups of people getting far worse after the stem cell transplant. I can't say that this didn't shape me. As more time elapsed, I learned of legal cases that were opened against the clinic for malpractice. The clinic in Beverly Hills eventually shut its doors. It was hard to know how to feel about this. The doctor had spin my saving grace 
He pulled me out of a half existence, but I could see where people's frustrations were coming from. As the clinic grew in popularity, I think his resources became stretched and his communication became worse. Nonetheless, that man will always remain the third angel in my tale and I'll always be grateful. It's hard for me to definitively recommend stem cells. I believe it's a gamble. Some got worse, but they did actually really help me. They didn't cure me, and some of my symptoms got worse, but they allowed me to be an active member of society again, and that was huge for me. A few more months passed. My girlfriend had moved to Australia, but she was being very distant with me and rarely answering calls. She broke up with me on Christmas Day while I was visiting my mum. I took it very badly, but it was also symbolically the end of one chapter and the start of the next. Despite our difficulties, I'm still grateful for the time we shared. There's always two sides to every story and I don't imagine it was easy being with someone who was tormented by my health problems as I was during the time. I returned back to Brighton and then I started living for the first time in years, really living. Me remaining Tom would throw parties nearly every night. I didn't drink or do drugs, but I was high on being able to participate. I felt like I was living in Brighton for the first time in my life. I was able to walk around, to take in the city, to live. I also started getting the attention of women. During my teen years, I wasn't the best looking and I was a bit awkward. During my early 20s, I was so sick I rarely went out. So this was new for me and I threw myself in head first. I realized that I really like pretty girls and pretty girls apparently like boys who make music. A lot of nights I'd go out by myself around Brighton and end up meeting a whole bunch of beautiful women. One night I ended up breaking into the Hilton Hotel with a girl that I just met. We managed to get onto the roof, but we were chased down the flights of stairs by security. We ended up having sex on the beach at two in the morning while the tide came in. The parties we throw would get crazier and crazier. There'd be times where everyone was half naked by the end of the night. I'd find myself in strange situations where I was having sex on a living room sofa with two girls while some random dude sat smoking a joint on a nearby table. I noticed this guy who was a friend of Romaine's who kept passing out on our sofa. One time he woke up covered in scratches from this Mexican girl who had been telling us stories the night before of all the people she'd stabbed. This guy was Goran Kendall. He sang like Bob Dylan and he looked like he'd fallen out of a punk rock band. I liked him. Me, Romain and Goran were all musicians and naturally we started jamming together. I remember the first time something clicked. We were at Goran's house with an Australian girl I'd been seeing and her friends. The night before she'd gotten drunk and tried to strip me naked during an open mic night at the Fiddler's Elbow. I was pretty willing and we both ended up in our underwear being kicked out in fits of laughter. We decided to start working out three part harmonies together. We figured out a cover of Octopus's Garden by the Beatles and not to blow our own horns, but it sounded fucking brilliant. I remember someone walking past the house and hearing from outside and they started to clap. Eventually the three of us would busk on the streets together. We all bust separately so it made sense. Back then, I'd occasionally drag a kick and a snare drum out with me in a wheelbarrow and I'd drum while Goran and Romain played and sang. We would always have people come up to us and they'd ask for our band name and we never had an answer. We came up with this genius idea of forming a band. Genius. One of us said that we should be called the Three Hats because there were three of us and sometimes we wore hats. One of us said, nah, that's shit. Eventually we settled on the big push and we got tighter and tighter. As my energy increased, I was able to do more and more. We play about five nights a week in various pubs and bars in Brighton for shit money. On Saturday, we'd get out onto the streets and go busking. There was just one problem. I was proper shit at drumming. The universe eventually provided us with a handsome bearded Irish man and everything fell into place. I loved those boys. We were in truest sense a rock and roll band. We got banned from playing at a few venues because we'd occasionally get carried away and break a bit too many things on stage. I got a lot of bills for microphone stands or charges for paint jobs where I'd sprawled the big push over the walls in permanent marker pen. Life was a bit like a movie. My ambition at the time wasn't to be in the greatest band of all time or to have any kind of success. I was just so relieved to be alive and play. So every day felt like a victory. Despite this, I was still carrying a lot of symptoms with me. The pain in my legs never stopped. The buzzing in my feet never relented. My vision was still blurry. I'd still get days where I was so foggy that it was hard to communicate. One day after a gig with the big push, being overstimulated triggered a very temporary jolt back into psychosis and, my f and I found myself lying on a table in the pub repeating the same sentence over and over again for about 10 minutes while surrounded by a very concerned group of onlookers. I came to in tears and I quickly left in embarrassment. If I didn't stick to my diet of about five different things, I'd be trapped in bed again, but it was okay. I was willing to hurt if it meant I could participate in life again, and I intended to live the fuck out of it. I met this beautiful Spanish girl one night after playing at a local pub, and I fell instantly in love. 
She had this beautiful blonde curly hair and was wearing dungarees and I was enamoured with her from the first moment that I saw her and she didn't make it easy which made me like her even more. I'd write her poetry, invite her to shows and attempt to be funny. She knew me as the local slut which didn't really make things very easy but with time she could see that I genuinely cared about her and I did, a lot. One time we snuck into a cinema together and I proceeded to climb onto what I thought was the stage below the screen to put on a show for her as she sat alone in the aisles cheering. What I didn't know was that stage wasn't a stage, it was a six foot drop. I confidently put my th feet on thin air and then I fell, smashing my face onto the corner of a railing on the way down, seeing a flash of white light and regaining consciousness with her rolling around in fits of laughter on the floor. She was intelligent, creative, unusual and beautiful. I carried a lot of trauma with me into that relationship. Relationships generally didn't feel safe for me. She was briefly diagnosed with BPD, which later turned out to be a misdiagnosis, and I had ma major trust issues from my last relationship, which had grown into commitment issues. It was a bit of a recipe for disaster, but we loved each other very intensely and very dysfunctionally until we couldn't. I wish I'd been able to surrender. It was a bit of Sid and Nancy, very dramatic to say the least, and I won't get into it for her sake, but it was beautiful, and I loved her very much. It taught me a lot. I learned that the echoes of the past had shaped me into something that I struggled to be. I envied the people who could jump into relationships and feel safe or content. I wondered if it was because I had to watch my mum and dad fighting till their marriage crumbled when I was a kid. If it was because I'd learned as a child that I had to be independent because external love was inconsistent. I wondered if it was because I'd been too late to save Joe. I wondered if it was because I was forced to live most of my adult life in isolation. I wondered if it was to do with my past relationships. I didn't know but I felt confused and I felt angry with myself. I knew I wanted to surrender to love, to feel truly worthy of it, but every time I tried, I feel con discontent and unsettled, like the security of love was something I wanted to escape. The thought of ending up in a white picket fence house with my perfect family felt like prison. After eight long years of being tethered to a body in pain, I wanted to be liberated from any sort of attachment. Any sort of predictability of the future after a life of torturous monotony made my stomach feel like I'd swallowed cinder blocks. When I felt someone's love, I had to fight the urge to run and keep moving, but paradoxically still desperately wanted to be loved. And I loved to love. And I loved her. That discontent was something that stopped with me, and it hasn't made relationships easy. Around 2018, I'd reconnect with Sam. He was in his 20s now, so I felt far less weird about hanging out with a teenage boy. During this time, we wrote a few songs together. Blind Eyed, What Went Wrong, and Same Old Situation. All bangers, by the way. It was April and we were shooting a video for what went wrong. We were using my friend Josh's car and there was a scene where we needed a smashed up bonnet. But it went outside of the budget we had to pay for the video. So me and Sam decided to go busking to raise the money. I promise what follows is the truth. We never rehearsed Blind Eyed Live before. But while we were out on the street, I turned to him and I asked if we should play it. I started playing the first chord that made sense without even thinking. It started in B minor in this kind of reggae way that was totally different to the original recording. Somehow, it was totally fucking magic. The whole street stopped. Sam was hitting notes and runs that seemed outside of the reach of a mere mortal. Luckily, Sam Perry Falvey, who films the videos, was with us, and he captured the whole thing on camera. Before this moment, I kind of surrendered to the fact I probably wouldn't have a career in music again. I was doing it for me. I was doing it to celebrate being alive. The week after the video shoot, me and Sam decided to go busking again because it had felt so good. Someone filmed us covering a version of Vera Hall's Trouble So Hard. posted it to a Mexican restaurant page on Facebook. It was the first thing that I'd done since returning to the land of the living that went viral, and it went very viral. It started being shared everywhere by millions of people. Two weeks after that, another cover of us performing went, was circulating the internet. That went viral too. By the time we released the busking version of Blind Eyed, the internet went crazy. My social media following started exploding. People like Elton John were talking about us on the radio. People would fly in from all over the world just to watch us perform on the street. By the end of summer 2018, we were shutting down entire high streets because of the volume of people coming to watch us perform. There was something magic about the synergy of me and Sam that stopped people in their tracks. We were being tagged in videos from all over the world of people listening to Blind Eyed. 
People were listening from war zones, from rocket launch sites, from deep in jungles. It was surreal and it was incredibly affirming. It was a second chance and I didn't think I'd get a second chance. The shared out with Sam was special. A lot happened after that. More love, more heartbreak, more health complications, more healing, more setbacks, more parties, more medications, sold out shows, frustrations with the music industry, betrayals, theft, friends lost to addiction. My health would take me on more journeys into foreign countries, number one albums, awards, a pandemic, meeting idols, making money, losing money. But I'll save all that for another time. It's fitting that this story ends here. Trouble So Hard by Vera Hall has always resonated with me very deeply. She was the daughter of a slave, navigating a hostile 1940s America, something I'll never be able to relate to. The pain and simplicity of the line, don't nobody know my troubles but God, was one that seemed universal to all struggles. And it was a line I was always deeply connected to. If there is a God, I want to thank you for giving me the resilience to be able to sit down here and to tell my story today. I hope it's far from over, and I hope that this is just chapter one. Thank you, everybody, for giving me the space to share my story with you. For everybody still in the dark, trust, hope, and, and dare to dream that you can get out of it too. I love you all, and thank you for supporting me like you have. Pew, pew, pew. Go through it. Wow, no, uh, thank you, Renz. Um, uh, love you too. Um, I found myself getting jealous the other day um, when I was watching the, the end of the one video when. Uh, it showed Ren and everyone hearing the news about um, hitting number one album and just how happy they all were and um, that he's being able to experience this with all of his friends um, that he has. Uh, I, I, I I've lost a lot of friends. Um, I look at my Facebook and I, I see all these lists of names, but these aren't, uh, these are people that I consider friends. Um, I've got no, um, I don't have any grudges on anybody for anything that that happened over throughout my life, really. Um, none that I can really remember. Nothing that was ever extreme enough to... Uh, life just pulled me in different ways. You know, my son early, when I was just 20, you know, not even barely 20, um... And I was just life moved me in directions that caused me to uh, lose touch with a lot of people. But I also got to meet a lot of people. And uh, but I, I don't think I have many friends now anymore. Um, they don't they don't contact me. They don't say hello. Um, and social media doesn't make it any better or easier. You'd think it would, but it, it doesn't. But, yeah, I found myself being jealous of Ren. Um, like I said, I, I, I'd like to talk to him to find out what he's going through right now. Um, but it looks like he's finding a way out of this. And that's what made me jealous, was that I, I'm still in it, fighting it, um, and it's awesome. He he deserves he deserves to be. He he deserves a, uh, to be cured. Um, he went through a lot worse than I did. I've just been going through it longer, 
but I, just part of me found myself just really hit by the fact that people are finding their way out of it um, and that's great and that's good but and hope that I will too but but just really weighed in heavy that it, it hadn't yet um, anyway that was great and um, yeah uh, thanks Ren thanks for uh, doing it uh, I'm glad you guys I hope you guys got something out of these um, anybody with Lyme disease please please comment on how things are going how you're dealing with it um, what, what what you're doing um, and um, yeah hopefully we can all uh, help each other out and boost each other up and, but anyway I have got to go to the bathroom and I need to get off this and uh, I want to do the new song so anyway later guys thanks see ya